I've been wanting to do this for a long time. This is the Agora or Agora. It's the marketplace, the main marketplace of Ephesus. It's, it's this huge open area. Of course, you would have had shops lining this place. You would have all kinds of events happening in here. No doubt the Apostle Paul would have preached in here. He preached at the, um, the lecture hall of Tyrannus. We don't know where that is. It's like that odium up there probably, uh, you know, the, the little, the little uh, concert hall that we had. But they think it was kind of in that direction. Uh, they, as an archaeologist, historians kind of say it was over there. We don't know where it was. It hasn't been excavated. There were synagogues here. None of them have been excavated. You saw the menorah up there on the steps. That's the only indication of a Jewish presence in the city, but we know there was a Jewish presence here. This is the marketplace, as I said, and this is where if you want to make a living, you've got to go here and sell things. If you want to, you know, of course, feed yourself or get clothing or whatever you need to do, you've got to come here to buy things. Now, here's the problem. Caesar worship. And Domitian was huge in Ephesus, especially at the time of the writing of the book of Revelation. John is on Patmos because of Domitian. Domitian is a megalomaniac. He was one of, his, as DeLake said, one of the worst emperors there was. He was terrible. And he was the first emperor to not just be declared divine, he declared himself living as Lord and God. That's pretty bad. There was a giant statue of him that people could see that, that again, DeLake, DeLake uh, described, where the head is, is huge. And, of course, it was on top of a matching size statue where boats could see it coming into the harbor in the city, which was the fourth largest city in all the Roman Empire. So it's, it's this a big place, and he's glorifying himself in the midst of it. Now, these niches right here leading into this marketplace and under any arches where you found these are really, really important because you would have statues of Caesar here and here and here. And one of these statues right here, there's no doubt, we don't know which niche, but one of the statues would certainly have been Domitian. Prior to that, you would have had Augustus, you would have had uh, um, uh, Tiberius and, and maybe one of the other Caesars, but it would be in these niches. And you had these guys here that were priests that would sit by these statues all day long. This was their big job. So that when you came through the arches into the marketplace, the rule was that you would take a pinch of incense and throw it onto a little charcoal fire that the priest was basically assigned, keep it hot, keep it burning. You'd throw a pinch of incense that they would provide and onto the, onto the fire, you know, of course, it would make a beautiful scent. You'd be able to smell it all over the place. And you'd have to say to the priest as you're passing by, may the luck of Caesar be with you. That is Caesar worship. Remember we talked about the Caesar cult, worshiping the god Caesar. When you would do it once a year, required across the empire, burning that pinch of incense to Caesar and eventually saying Caesar is Lord. That's your once a year assignment. And the Christians wouldn't do that either. And that caused a problem for the people in Smyrna. But think Book of Revelation now. John lived here. John was here. John was on Patmos when he wrote it, but this is where he lived, except for that interval that he was in Patmos. This is where, as far as we know, this is where he died too. And when he talks about something in the Book of Revelation, it made perfect sense to the people who read it. A Christian coming through these gates is not going to burn a pinch of incense to Caesar. He's going to walk right past it. And of course, the priest is going to run out saying, excuse me, but you forgot something. And the Christian would say, no, I worship Christ. And he would keep going. And the priest would say, go back and worship Caesar, honor Caesar. And if the Christian didn't do it and kept on going, then the priest would follow that Christian into the marketplace. The Christian is going into the marketplace for one of two reasons, to buy something or to sell something. Are you catching on to where this is going? The priest starts selling this, shouting, this man will not worship Caesar. This man will not be devout to Caesar. This man will not burn a pinch of incense to Caesar. And because Caesar is divine, and of course Domitian declaring himself Lord and God, and being a very wicked man, out here, what are the people going to do hearing the priest shout this behind this Christian who's come in here to buy or sell something? Nobody will buy from him. Nobody will sell from him. What do you call that? It's the mark of the beast. Now, it's not that the mark of the beast has come and gone. 
what John is saying and what Jesus is telling him is that, you know what that's like, you guys? Of course you do. You have to worship Caesar. If you don't worship Caesar the God, then nobody will buy from you, nobody will sell to you. And then he talks about this mark. They understand the mark of the beast and how it works, and you're standing right in the place where they got the meaning about that mark. Way back in Ezekiel chapter 9, Ezekiel has a vision. And in this vision, he sees six angels, one of whom is a scribe. And he is commanded in the vision to tell that angel, the scribe angel, to go put a mark on the foreheads of everyone who is weeping over the condition of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was, of course, caught in idolatry, steeped in idolatry. It's about to be sent again into exile, three, uh, three different uh, um, uh, sieges, rather, of Jerusalem. Let me get my words right here. And uh, one of the last sieges is coming upon them, and the people that are weeping are also going to go into exile. They're Jews. But Ezekiel has said, tell the angel, put a mark on the ones who are weeping over the condition of Jerusalem. In other words, they're not idolatrous. They're saying we shouldn't be this way. This shouldn't happen. They're going into exile too. And these are the Jews. And the mark that he's supposed to put on them, the word mark is tav. T-A-W or T-A-V. It's a Hebrew letter. Well, today a tav looks almost like an American N with a little curly Q at the bottom. But in those days, a tav looked like this, which I find very interesting. Put that on their foreheads. And then... He said, you'll go into exile, but you're not going to be harmed while you're in exile. There's the blessing. Now, you have those, that mark. Now move on all the way up into the book of Revelation. You've got another group of people that have taken a mark. The 144,000. And they're marked on their foreheads with the mark of the living God. Whatever mark that was, maybe it was another tav. But they're marked on their foreheads with the mark of God and the 144,000, 12,000 male virgin Jews from every tribe of Israel, all 12 tribes, they're going into the tribulation. But because they have this mark on them, nothing in the tribulation will harm them. Same thing. Ezekiel foreshadowed that which is in the future, our future. And then you have the great usurper. Here comes the Antichrist. And he forces everybody to take a mark too. A mark that indicates because of the whole scenario and the picture that I just painted for you, you can only draw one conclusion. What does the mark mean? It's not that it's a subdermal microchip or a tattoo or a barcode or anything like that. Could it be? Who cares? It could be, absolutely. But that's not the point of what John, the Lord, is trying to say through John. That it's who you worship with all your heart, who you're dedicated to with all your heart. The people who wept over Jerusalem were dedicated to the Lord God. The 144,000 dedicated to the Lord. And now you've got the mark of the beast, the beast, the Antichrist's flunky, the false prophet, requiring the people to take this mark to worship the beast. And anybody who doesn't worship the beast is put to death. But before they're put to death, you find that no one will buy from them no one will sell to them. When that message hit Ephesus, they got it. It's right there because you're standing in the place where they experienced that every single day they went into the marketplace. This is the place that rang true with these people. It's not just Ephesus. It's any marketplace in this part of the world. So all the people, all the seven churches, every time they went into Nogura, same arrangement and they knew what it meant. There is one more time you find a mark. We're not talking about the mark of Cain that's apples and oranges, so that doesn't count. But the last mark that you hear about are those who are the citizens of the New Jerusalem, and they have a mark that just says you belong there. Why the mark on the forehead and the right hand of the, uh, of the people who serve the Antichrist and worship him? This is who they worship. This is their loyalty. It doesn't have to be a subdermal microchip or anything. All it has to be is my dedication is to them. But why the right hand when you don't have a mark on any of the other uh, hands of the people? Because this marked you as a slave. Why did they forbid tattoos in the time of Moses? Because slaves were tattooed with a mark that said you belong to someone. Don't take the tattoo because you're no longer a slave. You came out of Egypt. 
right hand. A Hebrew would get it right away. I don't want to be a slave to this man. You get marked in your right hand, you are a slave to the Antichrist. And then the penalty comes in in the next few chapters. Man, you do not want to have taken that mark because to do so is spiritual suicide. You are burning in hell because of that. But this is the example that he gives. You're standing in it right now, the arch to this great uh, agura here that goes out again. How many people walked out of here with priests chasing after them? You didn't take the mark. You didn't, rather, you didn't burn the incense. You didn't burn the incense because they wouldn't take that mark of worship, so to speak. One last thing, if you looked at the, the dedication plaque for the patrons over the top of this arch, you'll notice that there's a very familiar name up there from the Bible, Agrippa, one of the Herods. And it's on the outside, of course, of this great arch on the outside, but he was one of the patrons that helped somehow establish the Agora, not the Library of Celsus, that was put in later. But the Agora is associated with Herod Agrippa too. So this is a really biblical site from the past and into the future, as it were, sending us that message. Pretty amazing, isn't it? All right. Amen, you guys. Amen. Amen. Amen.